What's going on, my fellow Bears fans? Welcome to another edition of Chicago Football Talk. Today, we're going to break down the preseason debacle or game, if you will, spectacle that happened yesterday on the lake front at Soldier Field. And uh, as I tweeted earlier today, I had just finished watching and breaking down that preseason game very extensively. It was nice to get back into it, actually, and look at some footage. And afterwards, I said, you know what? I'm going to have to get a beer before I recollect my notes. I've got pages of notes here we're going to go through. Uh, and I just knew I was going to need one. There's no special name to this libation. I'm going to keep it a secret, but you can take a look at how beautiful that looks. And I cheers to everybody. This, is, this goes out to all the Bears fans that went to Soldier Field, all the Bears fans that stomached watching that game, including myself. I was at my boy, Joe Sixpacks. My sister was actually at the game. Um... And my future brother-in-law, so cheers to everybody that made it through that game. We survived another preseason opener. Mm-mm-mm. And we're going to get right into the notes because I've got plenty of them. And if you don't know, I actually watch the games quite extensively. As I've said oftentimes, it's easy to watch the games again when the Bears did good. And that's what most people are going to do when the Bears do great. Oh, I want to see that again. And everything's fine and dandy. Nobody feels there's any problems to point out. But when things are at their worst... That's when I kind of shine through and show my strengths of what I do. Because a lot of fans have a lot of questions. And a lot of fans can't stomach to watch the game again. And that's where I come in. You uh, trust me. You know me. And hopefully some of you love me. Some of you hate me. But I'm here to give you my honest feedback as to what I thought happened during the game. The pluses and the minuses. Who played well. Who didn't play well. So let's get right into it. I'm going to separate it offensively first and then defensively. And we're going to start with the offensive line. One of my notes I put here is it's a good thing, a damn good thing that the Bears are focusing on getting rid of the ball quickly as there was uh there have been a few near sacks throughout the whole game, not to mention the sacks that already had taken place. And you saw actually the strategy, just the change in strategy of getting rid of the ball quicker helped the Bears out avoid at least three sacks that I counted. Um, and then a couple of the sacks that they actually took were when they held onto the ball a little too long. Matt Blanchard had one, Campbell had one, um, one does and stick out in my mind of where whether or not McCown had one or not but at least two those two quarterbacks each had one that were just caused by them holding on to the ball a little too long so anyway starting with the offensive line I thought Roberto Garza okay the Bears had that interception after the Colts drove the ball long and we'll get to defense later and that's when the offense finally took the field without Jay Cutler I would assume or not assume but uh let's make sure we qualify that for those that didn't watch it um And Roberto Garza right away, uh, after the Bears took over the ball on the interception, they tried running the ball on first down, and Garza got blown back and stood up at the snap by 99, who would be a thorn in the Bears' side anytime he was in there, Kevin Vickerson. Not any every single play he was in there, but Kevin Vickerson, who was in there after the starters left, actually, they left him in there. He was basically a thorn in Roberto Garza's side and also Chris Spencer's side. The guy was just making plays uh, up the middle of the field. And he altered uh, Bush's Michael Bush's running lane, so they weren't able to get diddly squat on that play right there. Roberto Garza, though, even though you would think that he played a decent game because he wasn't in there as long as everybody else, I noticed on the very first play of the game that, uh, that the offense took the field that he got blown back and stood up. So... You know, if I was to actually grade the offensive line like I normally will do and would do, uh, you know, that would be definitely a negative play. And he wasn't in there for many plays, so it was great overall. The percentage might not have been that good. But that was one thing I noticed about Roberto Garza right there. He did bounce back, but then Vickerson ended up making most of his plays on Spencer. Now, a few notes about Karimi. Garza wasn't in there that long, so those are the best notes I have on him. He wasn't perfect. No offensive lineman was in this game. Karimi, overall, I thought he played okay. You know, it's his first real contact versus an opponent uh, since basically when he got injured after playing a game in a quarter or two, whatever it was last year. Um, But on one play, he got blown back by Doomerville. Now, I know that there was a Von Miller, I believe, came out, and that was in Comcast Sports, uh, on Comcast Sportsnet, if I'm not mistaken, where they wrote an article about how Von Miller interviewed him, and he said Karimi was a beast. Well, you know, he did play good overall, um, which is why he was able to be rewarded by t- being pulled out of the game fairly early, earlier than Chris Spencer and, and Jamarcus Webb, who you see the theme developing here. Um, but he got blown back on one play by Elvis Doomerville, 
uh, which hurried Campbell's throw, if not interfering with the throw as well. And it actually caused Dumerville to deliver a blow to Campbell's head. Now, that ended up working out in the favor of the Bears, um, but he could have got hurt on that play. I mean, they got a, a flag on that play, but I don't think that's how that play was designed for Karimi to get blown back by Dumerville and let's see if we can incite a penalty on that play. So Karimi was not perfect by any means, regardless of who they talked to and who was being kind, saying he was a beast. Uh, on another play, Karimi had poor level. He showed it throughout uh, the, his snaps that he was in there. He had poor level on a running block, which actually forced the running, stuffed the running play and run, uh, forced the run to go nowhere. Um, also, on another play, he had poor, poor, very poor hand placement uh, versus the second string defensive end, which caused altered a running play as well. So, Karimi, again, like I said to many people, I expected him to, this is going to be his virtual rookie year. He's still a virtual rookie, and he showed that uh, in the few handful of plays that he played in this game as well. Now, Chris Spencer, I thought he played probably the second worst of all the starting linemen that was there. I was expecting big things from him. He looked good versus the Bears defensive line all camp long, but uh, he got handled on a few plays by Kevin Vickerson, giving up penetration. And again, he played, he came to play. That's why I'm even naming him number 99 on one play. He got pushed all the way back into Khalil Bell's path by Vickerson and, uh, and Vickerson again, he was kept in after this other starter set. And he bought Spencer, who was kept in later than all the other offensive linemen, that being Karimi and Lance Lewis, who probably played the best game of all the linemen out there of the starters and Garza. After all three of those guys sat, it was Webb and Spencer who were left to be delivered a message by one Mike Tice. And for good reason, because he got pushed back on a few plays by the backups as well. I'm talking about Spencer. Um he got worked by the backups. He got even pushed back into McCown, uh, forcing him to uh, get a near a sack near the end of the first half on their drive where they were driving the ball towards the end of the first half, too. So I apologize if it's a little choppy. I'm just reading off my notes here. Uh, so Spencer definitely was kept in late. Uh, into this game for very good reason by Mike Tice. Not just to send a message to Webb, which I know most people notice. Oh, Webb, he was in there in the fourth quarter. Even Matt Bowen saying that rarely ever happens to a starter. It wasn't just him either who needed a message sent to him. Chris Spencer did as well. And, you know, Chris Spencer at times played so poorly at times. Now, granted, this is just the first preseason game that it made me think that they might as well move Chris Williams from right tackle back to left guard and have him battle with Spencer to start breathing down his neck. Uh, and that's not just because of what I saw from Spencer, but also from from what I saw from Shiloh Rashad, who I'll get to later here. Now, Jamarcus Webb, I know a lot's been said about him, and I can just continue to add to it as well. Um, I wouldn't say that he played uh, the worst of all the linemen that played, but he played the worst of all the starters that played. And it's clear that Tice was trying to be hard on him, as he should. I tweeted this out yesterday, and I'm going to tweet, say it again. Uh, uh, Mike Tice playing Webb all the way into the uh, fourth quarter reminded me of like a sensei, a master, wanting to be very hard on his pupil, trying to break his spirit, trying to break him down of all selfishness and ego before building them up again. And in my humble opinion, Webb could use it. If your own quarterback, Jay Cutler, doesn't want to get into any commercials because he wants to prove himself first and he's already made a Pro Bowl, Webb should maybe look at Jay Cutler and follow in his steed. And I'll tell you what, he tweeted that just because you know, uh, Cannon was born on the same day that Webb was, that uh, that being J Jay Cutler's son, that he's going to protect Camden as well. Why don't you worry about protecting Papa first, okay? Because I would not want you protecting a uh, 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 baby bear, if you will, if you can't even take care of Papa Bear and that being Papa Bear Jay Cutler. So J Jamarcus Webb definitely needed to, to uh, serve his punishment, if you will, by staying in so late in such a meaningless game where they were blown out. And I can't wait to see what happens tomorrow at training camp. You know Tice is going to be all over them. Chris Williams, again, um, I'd have to say overall he played poorly. When you consider the fact that he played versus backups for most of the game, um, though, it wasn't a, though he was playing at a position that he hasn't had a lot of experience at at the pro level, okay, and that being the right tackle. Still, he was versus backups, and he got pushed back at a few times, and he got ran around at other times. Uh, even when Matt Blanchard was in, and that's our fourth string quarterback, he got bull rush on one third and nine play, um, though Matt Blanchard did hold on to the ball a little bit too long. Still, he got bull rushed, and that that I won't absolve him of that bull rush just because Blanchard held on to the ball too long. Because that was you're talking about third string defensive player that he's playing against when he got bull rushed. So um 
overall, though, he did do well on most of his run blocks. Though, again, I have to qualify it by saying that it was versus backups. So, uh, Williams played well versus the run, but we're talking about backups. When he played poorly against the pass, again, versus backups. So, I'm telling you, I, I, I don't even know. I'd start thinking about moving him back to guard, if you will, um, if they can't figure out how to get this guy going. And then I would say that also, as I segue into Shiloh Rochelle, the backup left guard, he did okay at times, but he got overpowered at others. And this guy used to start at the NFL level versus uh, when he played for the 49ers. He did do well on most of his running blocks, but again, he got overpowered on more than a few plays. Now, Ricky Henry, uh, he was one. I mean, if I were to say which lineman played the worst overall, it was Ricky Henry. I was not very impressed with this play at all. I thought he got pushed past, uh, pushed back, ran past, and thrown aside far too often. And he had that miscommunication on one play, which actually gave up a sack right up the middle of the line, which is one of the worst places you want to give up a sack. Um, moving along to James Brown. I didn't think he played as well as I hoped he would have, as well as I was trying to tell you guys that he should, that you would expect him to play well. But it could have been because he was disappointed and ice cold because he had to wait so long to play because Tice was delivering that message, that lesson to Jamarcus Webb. But still, that's no excuse because if... James Brown hopes to make this team. Those are going to be the circumstances with which he enters the game as a backup when somebody gets hurt. So there's no excuse, even if he thought he was going to play when he saw all his homies getting into the game and he's still sitting out. Maybe he took it personally. That's no excuse. Um, Now, he did on one play, speaking on the negative of James Brown, on one play, he lost his balance on a chip block, which actually allowed a sack. Uh, I think it was Armando Allen who had a chip block on the guy, and he had such a good chip block that when uh, uh, James Brown went to make the block, he whiffed, and he, he hit nothing, fell over, lost his balance, and that actually allowed a sack on that play. He also showed poor hand placement on a few plays, which allowed him to get shed by number 54, whom he was battling for most of the uh, time he was in. Um, But he did start to warm up and he got a better feel for blocking uh, the aforementioned number 54. He even showed a little of that nastiness in him that I've seen at camp towards the end of the game when he actually elicited uh, some extracurricular activity versus 54. So James Brown, I thought he started cold, uh, but he ended up heating up. So uh, now moving away from the offensive line to the running backs, uh, there's not much to say about Armando Allen uh, or uh, Unga or... um, who else got uh, B- Lorenzo Booker who got to play? I want to talk about Michael Bush. Uh, now, granted, he's a veteran, so he you could say that he knows that he's going to get better and he was just knocking the rust off of him. And he hasn't had a history of fumbled, uh, fumbling. But on that play where he fumbled, the blocking was actually set up pretty well on the play before he fumbled. I'm sorry. On the play before he fumbled, the blocking was set up really well. He only had one guy to beat, a defensive back who was smaller than him, and he couldn't beat that guy. He couldn't make a move on him, and he didn't try to run over him, and the DB ended up uh, making a tackle. That could have been a big gainer there, so I, I was not happy with that one play I saw it on Michael Bush. And then that fumble was costly, and that was mostly due to a lack of focus, um, which he did admit to after that play on the sideline, if I'm not mistaken. So, But again, I mean, come on now. He doesn't have a history of fumbling, so I'm going to just chalk it up to the first preseason game. But you did not help the offense out, and it needed all the help it could get yesterday for sure. And again, look, you got your, your first reps. You started over Forte. So I thought he should have been played a little bit better than he actually did play. Moving away from the running backs onto the wide receivers. The two wide receivers that I want to point out here uh, before we get to Jeffrey, who had the best game of the receivers, and also, you know, Summers. I didn't even put any notes on Summers, but Summers um, bounced back after he gave up, let that one guy make that pick. And after he he, uh, didn't get in front of, yeah, after he didn't get in front of that guy and made that pick, he made that one play uh, on that fourth and two where Matt Blanchard. Uh, And I don't have any quarterback notes here, but Matt Blanchard, I thought he played relatively well, came in and hit on five or six of his first few passes, did throw that pick as well. I told you he'd be aggressive. Uh, I told you he had a connection with some of these guys and he showed it. So I'm glad Bears fans did get to see that. And even some sports talk people, some media did notice Matt Blanchard play. And I I mean, I have not been shy or quiet about mentioning Matt Blanchard's play. So it was good to see them. But getting to uh, Dane Sonsenbacher, I thought Sonsenbacher should have came out to play. 
Uh, on special teams, he did try to make an effort, but that one on third and 11, the big thing about Dane Sanzenbacher, even though Jay Cutler's spoken highly of you, even though Lovey Smith pretty much has almost came out and said that, you know, you got a good shot to make the team on third and 11 with eight minutes and 32 seconds to go in the second quarter. He, he got a bad jump on the snap and he got absolutely stonewall by their backup defensive back, Drayton Florence. Now, granted, Dane Sanzenbacher isn't a starter either, but you couldn't ask. You couldn't have more trouble getting off press coverage than he did on that play. Um, th- that was also the same play where uh, Jamarcus Webb had that chip block, but due to his poor pad level and bad hand placement, he got schooled back to the inside, which actually gave up a sack on uh, Josh McCown. But um, Dane Sanzamacher getting stonewalled didn't help either. I mean, it could be McCown would have thrown to him if he didn't have so much trouble getting off the line. I mean, he was at the line for like two or three seconds, which is an eternity. So I was not impressed by Sanzenbacher on that play. Now, moving along to Alshon Jeffrey, I think Alshon Jeffrey showed everybody what the Bears wanted and hoped for when they drafted him. He used his body positioning to make great plays, came back to the ball, stove off ta- you know, uh, uh, the DBs, the smaller DBs, and even leaned forward to make a couple catches so that he could keep the DB behind him, boxed out very well, basically. So Alshon Jeffrey, just more things of uh, uh, more... He just showed us a preview of what's to come in Alshon Jeffrey's career. And my, did the Bears upgrade their wide receiver positions? I'm telling you. I mean, Brandon Marshall had that one catch, but Alshon Jeffrey showed out. And then we got Chris Summers, who's uh, ba- not even really on the depth chart. Pardon me for getting open there. I started to get a little warm. Um, but even then, you have Chris Summers making that excellent play on fourth and two, uh, where Matt Blanchard showed the confidence and aggressiveness I told you he would show, putting the ball where only he could get it, or only any other. And even that excited even Brandon Marshall, as we saw on the sideline. So um, those are my notes on Alshon Jeffrey. Welcome to the Bears. And uh, what a 180 Phil Emery has done at the wide receiver position. Probably the lone bright spot in this Bears game on offense was the wide receivers and Matt Blanchard, to be honest. Um, some other notes on offense before I shift to the tight ends. Um, and this allows me to segue to the tight ends. It's only the preseason, but I noticed something interesting. I don't know if anyone's pointed it out, but I noticed when they brought in Tyler Klutz, um, that, and Evan Rodriguez was in at the same time that they ended up shifting Evan Rodriguez to the, uh, wide tight end, much to my surprise. I've been saying all along and all camp long that, the uh, wide tight end position and the F were completely separate, and they are still, but I, I mean, they must be teaching Evan also. I haven't seen him take many reps at the wide tight end, is my point, in training camp. Yet there he was at the wide tight end position. So that tells me two things. Number one, he can play the Y if they need him to. And number two, the offense is that simple, the calls are that simple, that they can just line up, up, up on the Y also, and he can play the Y if they need him to play the Y. But almost all the time that Clutch was in there, Evan would Rodriguez was the guy playing the Y. Before I move along to the tight ends, I want to get back to Jeffrey for one moment by saying I noticed that Brad Biggs this morning on Mully and Hanley when he did his hit with those guys uh, mentioned, <laughs> let me button up here, that that he thought Alshon Jeffrey still has problems getting off press coverage. I don't know what game, and I'm not going after Brad Biggs. He was watching. Now, maybe because he was up in the press box, he got to see some better views than I did. But I looked extensively and did not see one single play where Alshon Jeffrey had any problems getting off press coverage. Maybe he mistook, you know, uh, 17 for 18. And I don't know how he could one guy's black and six foot four. The other guy's white and uh, five eleven or six one. And that's Dane Sanzenbacher and Alshon Jeffrey. Uh, but, but Dane Sanzenbacher was the one guy I saw having troubles getting off, uh, not on one single play. Now I'm not absolving or saying that Alshon Jeffrey, maybe Brad Biggs was referring to what he's seen in camp, but I did not see it in the game at all. And I was looking at every play extensively, uh, watching him say, Several times, like skipping back to see, watch every lineman and then watch all the wide receivers get off their blocks. So I don't agree wholeheartedly with what, what if you guys heard that this morning, don't just take it as fact. OK, I watched the film, I guarantee you more extensively than than uh, anybody in the media did. And I won't even name names, but that is not true. OK, so moving right along to Evan Rodriguez, um, like I mentioned earlier, Evan Rodriguez actually got quite a bit of playing time at the Y as well once Tyler Klutz got in. Now, even though Kyle Adams was inserted earlier in the game than Evan Rodriguez, Evan and Rodriguez actually got much more playing time uh, than than I expected him to, much more playing time than Kyle Adams. And even when Kyle Adams got put in, 
Evan Rodriguez was still at the white tight end, and Evan and uh, Kyle Adams was actually played the F when they were both in for one snap. They were both in together, and uh, Evan Rodriguez took the Y still. So I'm not. And the thing is, Kyle Adams has got like two or three inches on him and more weight. So I would assume that they would. But that tells you that they think that Evan Rodriguez is tougher and more physical than Kyle Adams. Um, and I saw it on the football field. Kyle, uh, Evan Rodriguez actually got under the skin of a few guys he was blocking. He unnerved a few guys to the point where they had extracurricular activity, pushing and shoving. And one guy even tried to throw Evan Rodriguez to the ground and actually did well after the, uh, the whistle blew. To Evan Rodriguez's credit, he did not retaliate or get up in the face of those guys. If I were him, and he probably did, he kind of took the Dennis Rodman approach and just smiled, knowing that he got in those guys' heads. So I was happy with what I saw out of Evan Rodriguez, though he didn't even catch a single pass. I know what he can do when he catches passes. Or I shouldn't say though he didn't get. I didn't notice him catching any passages. I was focusing entirely on his blocking because I know what he can do catching the ball. And uh, he did very, very well blocking, in my humble opinion. And those are my notes on Evan Rodriguez because I already mentioned most of them because I remember them, my friends. Moving along to the defense, and you say, oh, my God, he spent 20 minutes already on the offense. I'll be quick with the defense here. Um, and I'm going to just go through the list, not in any order, but just in order of arranging it, starting with the tackles first. Henry Melton, I thought he didn't get barely any pressure while he was at the three technique. Um, there was one play uh, where Peyton, that one play where you guys remember where Peyton Manning had all day to throw, they actually kept in two extra guys to block. So it was seven on four. Now, six of those guys double teamed uh, three of the guys. So it was two on one for, you know, six of those guys took three of our guys. Henry Melton was the only guy that was single blocked, and he got buried on that play. If you don't believe me, go back and look at that play. Peyton Manning didn't have many snaps. You'll see seven on four, and the only guy that was single block was Henry Melton, and he got buried, okay? Uh, and then uh, now on the one play, the one good play that Henry Melton had, it was after Bush fumbled. Melton actually came in unblocked on a tackle for a loss, um, but that was mostly caused by Stephen Paya. He did a good job of taking up two blockers, and, G and so Henry Melton came in unblocked on that play and you better come in and actually Gino Hayes shot the gap that uh Henry that Stephen Payer was taking up two blockers from uh which allowed both of those guys to make that tackle it wasn't a, a solo tackle by Henry Melton it was an assist tackle Henry Melton and Gino uh Hayes for that tackle for a loss so Henry Melton needs to come to play I didn't see any pressure from the three technique and that's the one thing we need from the three technique now now, go, moving along to Stephen Paya, he didn't get a lot of pressure at the nose tackle either, as one fan pointed out to me on Twitter last night when I talked about Melton, must be a Melton fan. I mean, I don't criticize it. I love all Bears fans. Um, but he did point it out. He was like, Paya didn't, you know, and I, but I was like responding, you know, well, Paya's not playing the three. The three technique is the one spot where you want, expect a lot of pressure to come up and penetration in the backfield. You want it from your nose as well, but that nose has to be more disciplined and take up a couple blockers. He's the run stuffing uh, defensive lineman or tackle of the two positions. So uh, I just thought I'd point that out again. Peyton Paya did get a nice pressure when he attacked the guard on one play where Lance Briggs lined up over the center. Uh, Paya was still playing the nose tackle, but he uh, he actually got very nice pressure on the guard uh, when when Lance Briggs was able to occupy the center by showing blitz, even though he he backed off on another play on third and long. Paya lined up at the three technique, but he actually hit the one hole still playing the nose and he dropped their center. He basically buried their center on the ground. Then at 6.44 in the first quarter, on third and goal from the 10-yard line, Paya actually got his first rep at the three technique, and he completely obliterated their guard, thereby hurrying Caleb Haney's throw and allowing the Bears not to give up a touchdown on that play. So even though some people may be a little, and I'm not, no, you know, I'm not here to be a Paya fan or, or like I got stock in there or like I'm half Polynesian or anything, even though you guys know I love my Polynesian players. Um, I'm just calling it like it is. Paya played nose for almost all the snaps that he took. And when he played his very first snap at the three technique, he completely obliterated the guards. I called out the times. So if you want to go check it out, you go check it out and you tell me. I'm telling you I was right. Moving along to Nate Collins. I thought he flashed on a few plays. He got some pressures versus the twos. Um, but I honestly think that overall he was in for a lot of plays and he didn't flash. He flashed on uh, he didn't flash on as many plays 
He basically didn't flash on more plays than he did. Um, I think that eventually Brian Price is actually going to pass him up in the rotation once Price gets his legs underneath him. And that allows me to move along to Brian Price. I thought Brian Price showed some quickness and some dominating strength as well at times. He showed a willingness to something I've always harped on, getting down on all fours if you need to plug the hole. If you know you're going to lose the battle or it's a running play for sure, get down on all fours if you have to to get penetration and plug the hole. And Brian Price was willing to do do that. Overall, I thought Price played pretty, Price played pretty well, um, though he did show that he still has some conditioning issues, and he started to look gas after they kept him in for several successive snaps. But I thought I expected him to play dominating versus the backups, and when his legs were fresh, that's exactly what he did do. Getting to Matt Tawinia, I thought he had a good rush when he was at the three technique. On one good rush on third and long, he was actually at the three technique because they have both of their tackles play um, basically the three technique on whenever it's third and long. And Toyana had a good rush on one of those. Now, moving along to the defensive ends, I thought the defensive end that played the most impressive overall was Corey Wooten. Even though he was sackless in the game, uh, he got some decent pressures. Uh, he showed uh, some moves and some counter moves. And he was playing playing versus pro bowler Ryan Clady because Peppers was out. He drew a holding penalty when he was basically choked by Ryan Clady. Uh, he set up a nice outside-inside counter move on the following play after he was choked when he drew that holding penalty. And on the right interception, it was Corey Wooten who showed good power, leading, leading on a stunt, a stunt that he had with Corey Melton, which knocked the guard off his feet and hurried Peyton Manning's throw. He basically fell to Peyton Manning's feet and hoard that throw that uh, DJ Moore tipped up. So... As sh- and that should be the case, Corey Wooten did even better once the uh, Denver Broncos backups were in. So de- I encourage you to go take a look at that. Now, getting to D- Israel Adonijay, I thought he was okay overall. Um, he had one standout play, in my humble opinion, where he got a good pressure on second and 10 versus one-on-one blocking. So I thought Adonijay played okay, but Wooten had the best game of the ends, in my humble opinion. Moving along to Shea McClellan, and I know there was a lot said about Shea McClellan. Um, I thought he had a relatively good game overall, considering how much the Bears were asking of him uh, with the position switch at the pro level. Uh, definitely he got obliterated when he showed poor pad level on that goal line play, though he was double teamed, okay? So a lot of people want to uh, talk about how he got obliterated on that play, but fail to recognize and fail to point out the fact that he got double teamed on that play, let's keep it real your boy Roy that's my specialty I'm here to do that um he still showed overall though that he looks like he could be a great linebacker in a 3-4 or a 4-3 and and if worse comes to worse and and I mean who knows what's going to happen after next year but he showed the athleticism if they if they can pull off the position switch with him it will only help him be a more complete defensive player if he's actually able to put that man beef on him but he i was impressed he did show that he's learning the moves that they've been trying to teach him because he showed a couple counter moves there that allowed him to put on pressure he put on pressure he heard a couple throws um he got that quarterback hit he showed a a willingness to want to make contact which is what you want to see and he showed great hustle even coming all the way down the line to make a tackle on the sidelines so um But, yeah, I thought he did show confidence in the few moves that he's learned, and he shows that he's been – that he's uh, actually picking up the teaching that Marinelli's giving him because he showed – he flashed a couple of those moves that I haven't seen him show at all in camp at all. So, I was – overall, I was happy to see that Shea McClellan made a couple moves because I know that's what people wanted to see. Moving along to uh, the the, the defensive end line, uh, Cheetah Azugwe, I thought he flashed plenty of quickness and hustle, but he definitely needs to get stronger. Uh, As much as Shane McClellan needs to get stronger, Cheetah needs to get even more stronger than, than, uh, uh, more strength than Shane McClellan does. But I thought Cheetah showed, he flashed some quickness, and it's good that they have him in camp. What they'll do with him, who knows? Uh, You know, one of the guys that I left out here was Chauncey Davis. He actually didn't get a lot of plays in in this game, but they already know what they have of him. Cheetah, they gave him a lot more reps, and he flashed quickness. Um, he flashed some good closing speed, but he also needs to put on strength, uh, in my humble opinion, before he can crack the rotation or has any hopes of it. Now, JT Thomas moving along to, to uh, the linebackers here. I thought JT Thomas played the most impressive game of all the linebackers. Um, Geno Hayes, just to move to him real quickly, 
Um, I thought he showed some good recognition, and I thought he showed a good amount of quickness and aggressiveness. He filled a hole to make a couple plays in the backfield, but JT Thomas, maybe because he played more, uh, maybe because he played against the backups, he showed why the Bears have held on to this guy. He looked like he was eager to play and like he had had a lot of time off. Uh, he was all over the field looking to hit anyone he could, and again, I thought he was most of the uh, the most impressive of the linebackers, even though he was playing against backups. Um and that's just based on effort and toughness. So I qualify it because it's not like Roach didn't play a good game. He made a few plays. It's not like Briggs didn't make uh, uh, look good because he made a few plays as well. But JT Thomas had played the majority uh, of the game, played more than the other line, the aforementioned linebackers, and I thought he was the most impressive. Uh, on a side note, I thought that Blake Costanzo uh, missed a few plays, made a few plays, but missed some tackles too. And uh, same thing with uh, DeSico too. I thought he missed more plays than he made. And I would actually rate Blake Costanzo's performance ahead of uh, Dom DeSico. So that's the linebackers. Now getting to the secondary here before we wrap it up. I'm crossing the half hour mark. So I know a few of you guys who have that short attention span, who like short YouTube videos, are, are already got your finger on the comment button. But hey, this is how we do. Uh, to borrow a good line from my good friend uh, of Benny Dallas Jr. Blues for Bleeds this on YouTube. And the secondary, I thought Major Wright, starting with the safeties, I thought he played good overall. Um, he showed some very good recognition. He broke on the ball. Uh, he showed a willingness to make uh, uh, some tackles and put his nose in there and be tough. Uh, he saved a few plays. He, he had quick recognition quick recognition which allowed him to break on that ball on that interception and put himself in a position to make an athletic interception there when dj moore tipped it up when Corey wooten got that pressure and contrary to popular opinion i'm not here to defend major right because i was one that tweeted here we go again when he was out with that tightness on the hamstring he was actually in he still kept playing after that interception uh lovey did say they plan to pull him at the same time that he was ruled out for tightness in his hamstring but uh major right did play after that interception and you can actually see on the broadcast that the interception, the uh, hamstring injury must not have been that great because they had a very, they didn't have the ace bandage wrap on them. They had the light plastic wrap on them and it was a small ice wrap that they had on his hamstring. So like the media reported afterwards, afterward, and they talked to him in the locker room, he doesn't expect to miss any practice. And it was a very, it was just tightness. They were just being precautionary as they should be, especially with him. So he should be ready to practice. If he's not practicing tomorrow, then we can start uh, alerting off some of those bells. So I think he's taking a little bit of undue heat, but hey, it's not like he doesn't deserve it because he's the guy that missed all those the, the significant amount of time with injuries already with a few nicks and bruises here and there. Let me catch my breath before I move a little, a little forward. Again, cheers to all the Bears fans who even stomach thing through this breakdown, but I hope you appreciate it because I'm pointing out things that I haven't seen pointed out anywhere, I haven't heard pointed out anywhere, and this is all my own opinion after extensively watching every single play of that preseason game. Mm. I'll let you guys know what this beer is on the live show, which is most likely going to be on Wednesday, their day off, if not Tuesday, the day after camp. Monday, we can't do it because they have a night practice on Monday, so, and I'm planning on being there. Uh, now, moving right along to Kret Stelts, I thought Kret Stelts had a pretty solid game overall. Um, he was in on several plays. He played disciplined like I expected him to and confident, and you can play confident and disciplined when you know the defense. He was in on a lot of tackles. He showed a willingness to just put his body on the line, and, and he basically was in. He hit a lot of people out there, and every time early on when he was in, when I was like, who made that tackle? And you see number 20 get up. It was Craig Stelts. So I was impressed with Craig Stelts' play, solid and steady as he always is getting back to now uh moving along the safety line brandon harden I, I was impressed with what brandon harden did overall um i do have some pointer or not pointers but a, a knock on him that i noticed that hopefully he'll clean up but he showed great range like i thought he would when he had that near interception in that game in the game you gotta make you gotta put the hands together you know bring that ball home bring that pick home that's one he should have had and i'm sure he'll be regretting that he didn't but he did show a willingness to hit and be hit um both on defense and special teams and that's one way you know that's what he's going to need to do it's not like he's in any danger of being cut but if he wants to be the first guy called uh when a safety needs a blow or if somebody gets dinged up or hurt um he's gonna have to play a little bit more disciplined and know the defense without a doubt 
Um, but one thing I noticed about him, and this is something, again, that I'm pointing out right now, the only negative thing I noticed about him is that sometimes he waits for contacts to come to him. Maybe he's just trying to be disciplined and make sure that he doesn't uh, give up a lane or, or you know, uh, give up too, too much of the edge. But he, you can't sit and wait to make a hit in the pros. And there was one play. I wouldn't be surprised if he got a minor concussion on the one play where they got a touchdown in the end zone where he was just waiting to get tackled and he got rocked. Uh, I don't remember what play it was, whether it was a third or fourth. I didn't actually write it down. But if you go back and look at all the Denver Bronco touchdowns, you'll see one Brandon Harden wait and sit and wait for a guy to run him over, which is exactly what happened. Then he tried to put his head down at the last minute, and he got rocked, got hit by a forearm or an elbow. I'm not sure it was, and he was slow to give up. Um, And that's the thing. You can't wait to get hit. Because you need to deliver the blow or else you will be the guy hurt on your back or in this case on his stomach as it was in that one play. Calvin Hayden, um, something I just thought I'd point out there. Will Height was played very physical yesterday. Um, Hayden made a couple plays here and there, but I noticed he seems to be playing the backup nickel position. That's what he was playing at the end of the half. So um, I guess he's our backup nickel for now, and I think that's not the first time that's been pointed out. Lastly, I'll talk about Isaiah Frey. I thought Isaiah Frey played a pretty good game like I expected him to. Um, There were a couple plays that he could have made. He left out on the field, but he showed his great pass breakup skills on a couple of plays just like I thought he would. Um, And also, he showed very good effort on special teams as he he tried to get in on as many tackles as he could even while he was being blocked. And that's something that he's going to have to do if he wants to secure a spot on this roster. So overall... Uh, I can't wait to see training camp practice on Saturday. I think it should be very physical. Uh, I think it's going to be a mauling practice. I can't wait to see what Tice does. Uh, I wouldn't wait. I wouldn't be surprised to see if he makes a couple adjustments here or there. Maybe he moves Chris Williams back to guard. Uh, I don't think. I don't know if that'll happen because Shiloh Rashal, in my opinion, um, had an okay game. And he got pushed back, like on the very first play he was in, he got pushed back. So I wouldn't necessarily try to light a fire under Chris Spencer by um, giving Shiloh Rashad more reps because I don't think he really earned them in the preseason game that I saw yesterday. Uh, it is only the first preseason game, but there is stuff there that needs to be worked on, okay? Uh, I know they were playing bit very vanilla, but still, you would hope to see more from these guys. And granted, Jay Cutler and Matt Forte didn't play. Matt Forte would have made that DB missed or at least give him a stiff arm or had a nice, nasty cutback on that one that Bush didn't. And you would hope that my, Matt Forte wouldn't just fumble the ball on the toss, though he, had, he did uh, allow a forced fumble or two in practice uh, most recently in camp. Um, and then Jay Cutler didn't play at all either, so you would think he would get a little bit more of a connection. And, uh, and I think Jay Cutler should have played, so I'll be critical of Lovey Smith on that one. But overall, again, there's plenty to work on. I wouldn't get as alarmed as everybody else is getting, even though it was a pretty bad loss. I know everyone was excited to see the game as I was. I mean, I got food to cook out. We cooked out with my boy Jay, Joe Sixpack, but... You know, that's the way the cookie crumbles. At least it's only preseason. So I hope you learned a little bit from my breakdown. It is extensive, but that's how I do. So anyway, we'll talk to you soon. I'll be going to camp as many times as I can coming up in this week here, uh, starting with uh, tomorrow's practice, hopefully. If not, I will definitely be there Sunday when I go with Michael Montato. So your boy Roy will look forward to the next preseason game, Saturday versus the Redskins. And we'll see what happens as we come out of camp. Again, we did sign Derek Walker. We'll see where they play him. I still think it's going to be at tackle, not at end. So there will be more to come. Thanks for watching, as always. Your boy Roy for ChicagoFootballTalk.com. Peace, and I'm out. Thank you.